Okay, I think we are live here, uh, uscfootball.com live show. We promoted it with Keely Ewer, but she's feeling a little under the weather, but I'm Ryan Abraham, publisher of uscfootball.com. Shotgun Spratling, do it all man on uscfootball.com. Loves to talk about basketball. We try to swelch that whatever we can. What's up, Shotgun? What about the basketball team? They're actually winning right now. <laughs> they are, and uh, there was some, man, there was just some news that went by Twitter from the LA Times. Tony Bland is no longer employed by USC. I did not see that. Yeah. When I went down here, I yeah. was not checking Twitter on the way down here. I was actually yeah. being a safe driver, mostly because I was in a hurry to get here. Right. Yeah. You made it like with two minutes to spare. So again, um, uh, Keely is not feeling well, so she's not going to join us. And I'm trying out new software. I hope you guys can hear us. Let us know if you can hear us. Keely's the one that was the expert in this, this new software. Uh, we're saying, what's up? What's up? Okay. So that's cool. So I guess you guys can hear us. Um, that's at least one step in the right direction. I'm going to play with you. We got a bunch of uh, comments and stuff. So basically what we do here, if you don't know, um, it's a live show. We go for an hour, hour and a half, whatever it is, and we'll talk about the USC Jordan football team. Uh, talk about the assistant coaches and some of the, the moves that have been made. Uh, and we also want to talk about some scholarship math I brought up. I have a screenshot here. We can Ooh. look at this. So you can see this is my scholarship distribution chart. So we can kind of play with that a little bit. So we'll, we'll look at that kind of where USC. Uh, so Giovanni says it sounds like you guys are in a wind tunnel. Really interesting. Okay. Um, sorry about that. But we'll, we'll do our best. I'm in our little studio here. Um, yeah. So this is what we do. And we love to interact with all of you guys. So if you have questions or comments, I'll try to make sure I can kind of go through. It looks like I can scroll through these guys over here and uh, and and uh, post your comments and all that kind of stuff. So um, we do appreciate you coming on, and you can you know you can watch this in replay mode afterwards as well. But so this is kind of new software. I think that Keely's played with. I, this is my first time using it, so hopefully it works okay. I was going to try to do two cameras in studio apparently you can do it but there's like some jerry rigging that needs to happen so we're just going to be i'm going to be next to shotgun i usually like to be up on my perch away from the yeah up the, in the, the ivory the, tower the small people the keelys <laughs> and the shotguns but we're going to be together and uh, again hopefully keely's feeling better um all right so i guess we can get started with what the did you guys get to talk your last show about uh, were the coaches hired at that point? Were they official the last time you guys? They were not. That was this week. So okay, yeah. So that was this week. So I kind of get we do I know everything of, blurs together. Yeah, we do like this podcast. So um, USC had three open assistant coaching spots. Uh, two have been filled. Both are now former uh, offensive uh, off, quality control assistants yeah. is what they were. They weren't grad assistants. They were quality control. Basically support staff people. So, so Kerry Colbert has been a great assistant. He has been, yes. Uh, but so now Kerry Colbert is going to work with the tight ends and or inside receivers. Usually they don't split up the receiver position. We see that I think more spread teams. I went out and covered Fresno State. They had offense. They had outside receivers and inside receivers. It's like different positions. Um, it's interesting because T. Martin kind of talks about he wants all those guys to play uh, both, but. Kira Colbert will focus on inside receivers and tight ends. Takes a little bit off the plate of uh, John Baxter and potentially T. Martin. Yep. So the two kind of coordinators, the offensive and, and special teams coordinators, a little bit less, I guess, for them to do. So maybe that's part of the reason. I think that's a smart move just to, you know, kind of divvy up the responsibilities a little bit more. I mean, you saw there were some struggles with the special teams, obviously. The tight ends weren't very good. So if you take away some of those responsibilities, maybe you can focus a, a little bit more on one. And, and because of how much time USC spends on special teams in practice, maybe that takes away time that you can spend with your tight ends and doing some other drills or, you know, the guys that aren't on all those special teams. Though the tight ends are used a lot on those special teams. Um, the job becomes a little bit more difficult for Kerry Colbert because Deontay Burnett leaves. So yes. previously you say, unexpected. Deontay, yeah. go do what you do. Now you're like, okay, now we got to coach up these guys. we got to do some different things. Um, you know, Kerry Colbert has played played some slots uh, when he was at USC. You could talk a little bit more about that as far as that goes. But saying I'm old or something. Or yes, I am saying you're old. <laughs> if you're going to sit in your ivory tower over there, and I'm going to be a little person. I'm here with you. I'm here with you. <laughs> but, I mean, and I think you could talk a little bit more about that, about, you know, the role he kind of played at USC. And then I know he played a little bit of slot at the next level as well. So 
he's played both in and out, so he can you know te teach those positions as well from experience. Um, whereas if you were to give that role to John Baxter with the tight ends, and if you were to divvy up that way, then you know that's not something that Baxter is is probably fluent in. All right, we have also uh, Brian Ellis who. I did a story on him uh, in December leading up to the Cotton Bowl. Once Tyson Helton left for Tennessee. Is that an orange? You got an orange on Astros hat. Oh, so, well, for a quick, quick, quick story. Uh, so last night I was wearing a Kansas City Royals hat, and someone was like, why are you wearing a Royals hat? You should be wearing a Dodgers. So naturally I had to wear an Astros. Not, oh, ouch. For you Dodgers fans. They won the World Series. So don't don't talk trash to Shaka on his hat. <laughs> he has a hat for every occasion. Seven and three-eighths if you want to send him one. Um, pretty good, right? Nice. Okay, Brian Ellis. Uh, I know, so everyone's upset because he, yes, he was a Western Kentucky coach. Uh, he was promoted when Tyson Nutton left for Tennessee to be the offensive coordinator uh, for the bowl game, um, and now he's the permanent uh, quarterback coach. So I get, I, I think each hire there's there's good value, like in a vacuum. I mean, the issue is there's too much of it. Like there's too much of the internal, like did. You need an outside voice coming in and going, hey, you know, you could do things this way. I think I think that's why a lot of the USC fans are kind of mad. The deal of McCullough seemed like a home run hire, right? Definitely. Go out and do that again, and it doesn't seem like that's what they did. And it doesn't seem like they even really went out and looked. They just had their guys internally, and, and that's where they went with it. And, hey, that's worked out for them with KU and some other, you know, moving Johnny Nansen over the, line, the outside linebacker spot. So they've been able to find guys in their system already. And that helps because, you know, everyone knows exactly, you know, this is the way we do things and stuff like that. But as Dan Weber pointed out and as you uh, reemphasized, <laughs> maybe sometimes that's not the best thing. Maybe you need somebody to question like, hey, what if we do this this way or what if we, what if we change these things? Yeah. Uh, so sometimes a little bit of, of new blood is good in that regard. And I think with Dylan McCullough, you saw he did things differently. I mean, yes. a, lot, a lot of new drills, a lot of new tools that he used. Uh, and, and it worked. Obviously. And now, now, granted, Ronald Jones is not a guy who fumbled the ball a lot previously in the career, but he had zero fumbles and he, you know, carried the load this year. Stephen Carr, I think, was the only running back that had a fumble. Maybe, yeah. maybe I consider where had one or a via Malafi, but you know, the, the fumbles were very limited with that group, which uh, you kind of wonder why does Sam Donald not work with that group a little bit? Uh, you know, some scramble <laughs> drills or something uh, with some of those tools that Dylan McCullough had. Yeah. Uh, and and maybe we'll see Brian Ellis incorporate some of those. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, now that he takes over that position, you know, one of the things with Brian Ellis is that. At least Sam Darnold was very complimentary of him leading up to it. Now, you wouldn't expect Sam Darnold to, to crap on anybody. Yeah, but He sucks. Yeah, I can't believe I like, <laughs> That's why I had a bad Cotton Bowl because of him. Or yeah, exactly. Or, that's why I turned the ball over three times in the Cotton Bowl because of Brian Ellis. I, think I don't was, think he said that. I think we're just kidding. more the offensive line there. <laughs> that was, yeah. Uh, so the two new – and so there's still an open spot for running backs. I don't – I mean, sure, the, the coach is here. I mean – we talk about on the podcast. They 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 read our stories. They they understand. Like there's there's a sense of people don't necessarily like the hires all that much. You know, individual guys and stuff is great, but it's like you have so many dudes that are like former, um, you know, grad assistants or former support staff people on staff. It's like for a for a new head coach who's only been around a couple of years, you'd rather not have as many of like if Nick Saban wants to hire some, that's fine. Like he's done this forever. Whether it's you know, a guy that's been around for two years doing it, then you're like, well, I don't know. So I don't know if they've heard that kind of. I, I think they have, and maybe they go out and get another kind of deal in color for the running backs coach. We'll see. I don't think there's a grad assistant on staff that they could. That I don't could think do. there was anyone working with the running backs that, that they're <laughs> going to promote in that regard. And Prentice, Prentice, oh, who is he? Prentice Gill was working with the Butch receivers. Yeah, he was. Okay. So you, you know, you look at the running backs coach position. It looks like you know, from what I've heard from a couple of the recruits and stuff, it looks like it's going to be a couple of weeks. Before yeah. Clay Helton makes that decision, maybe, day, maybe that comes after signing day. You know, they're you know they're, they're, their focus right now is probably on that rather than since they already have one running back in the class, rather than getting a coach right now. You, know, you kind of focus and say, do we need to focus on that or do we need to focus on signing these last four or five guys? That, you know, the top guys that are on our board. Uh, which one is more important at this moment? And since you're not really going after that second running back, since it, it seems that the the candidates are kind of Kind of went away with Dylan McCullough, uh, you know, signing or being hired away by the Chiefs. You know, a lot of those were East Coast guys. Then you don't have the same connection. That he had those connections. Then it seems like USC is saying, let's just focus on the re recruiting portion now, and then we'll get to the running backs coach after afterwards. All right. Well, let's look at. Okay, so I'm gonna you know, hide this. You guys are gonna start a live show. So I'm playing around with this. Let's go 
and uh, look at the scholarship distribution chart. So I'm going to pull this up here, and I can I think I can scroll around and you guys can see it and stuff. Um, so we've done these before. I guess I'm using a hand. I'm talking with my hands, but you guys can't see me right now. Uh, we've done these before, and once we moved merged into 247, that kind of like the format got screwed up a little bit. So I've done this on Google Docs and kind of show uh, what we have. You know what we have here. Um, not that many seniors left the program. So if you look at the math right now, as of right now, uh, with 10, you see these green guys, those are the, the new signees. So these guys signed in the early signing period, one JC transfer, uh, Caleb Tremblay, but um, 82 scholarships are used of the total of 85, and you already have four verbal commitments. So if you do the math, that's 86, and it doesn't add up. But there's going to be some attrition. And what the way football works, it's different than other sports. It's a headcount sport, meaning you don't have half scholarships. It counts all at once. And it's a summer to summer sort of thing. So once the summer comes around, then you have to be compliant up to the, the 85 scholarship. So there's going to be some of these people no longer on the roster. Uh, or no, or no longer with scholarship. I'm not, yeah. I mean, USC gives four year scholarships. However, there's never really been clarity. Maybe you know this on the walk-ons. If yeah. they get a four-year scholarship, because usually walk-ons was, hey, you get till the end of the year. We're going to give you, you know, the money for this, and then maybe we'll renew it. That was previous before the four-year scholarship. There's never really been clarity. Like, do do the walk-ons? Is it four-year scholarships just for you know recruited guys, or do the walk-ons suddenly get the rest of their time paid? We haven't seen anyone kind of being taken off, but that was something that that Lane Kiffin actually talked about. This was obviously prior to the four-year scholarship. But that he talked about how, you know, just because a guy's on scholarship now, now as a as a walk on doesn't mean that he's going to be on scholarship next year. So we'll see how that kind of plays out there. There could be a couple of those guys that maybe, you know, they do not get their scholarship renewed for the next year and they stay on the team. You, yeah. know, you could see a couple of those special teams guys because, hey, if you're Clay Helton, you want to, you know, help these guys out for the year. We have extra space, but let them know then this is not guaranteed for next year. You got to work your tail off to, to potentially get that spot next year. Maybe we'll see something like that. Um, and then also there's the constant rumors on the P about the transfer market and who will be leaving USC. You just assume you know, pretty much every year there's a, a little bit of attrition uh, from players that are not going to the NFL or their careers are not uh, – they have not used all of their um, athletic time with the NCAA, their eligibility. So sometimes that's a medical retirement. Sometimes that's someone transferring out. Uh, you know, you see that every year. I mean, you look at even last year, Kevin Scott just uh, committed to uh, Reno, Reno, Nevada. Right, yeah. uh, you look at Noah Jefferson is another guy who's currently on the market and is being recruited by a bunch of big time schools as well. Those guys were on the on the roster, uh, you know, around this point last year. Maybe maybe they were off a little bit earlier, but you know, they were you know a part of this '85 previously. Yeah. And then they didn't finish their four years at USC. You, you see it every year. So you see some guys that are backups, they're looking for more playing time, but don't just automatically assume. That's one of the things where the P that gets a little bit annoying. Like, oh yeah, this guy, bland, he's gone. He's got to be. <laughs> it's not always about what's happening on the football field. So right. Some guys really enjoy their time. You know, they, they have a great major or whatever it is. They have a great fraternity. You know, they're loving the frat life, whatever it may be. And they stay at USC. Football is not their number one priority. For other guys who football is their number one priority, they leave and go find a, another opportunity. So we'll see how that shakes out. As Ryan said, that all has to happen before the summer. Is that correct? Before uh, summer classes begin? Yeah, I think uh, I think it's like July. It might, I think it might be before the fall classes. It's some I don't know the exact date, but it's a summer kind of transition. Um, and you can see on the chart, there's four players that were former walk-ons. So Ruben Peters, um, Grant Moore, the linebacker, Reed Butterovich and Chase McGrath. So um, you wouldn't think Butterovich and McGrath would come off since they were just given the scholarship. So they were given it, um, you know, during the, you know, after the, was it after the bowl game or before the bowl game that they do it? Uh, I believe they announced everything after the bowl game. I'm not exactly yeah. sure when. Because uh, one of the, Reed Butterovich was towards last year's scholarship limits and Chase McGrath was towards this year. Yes. So Reed Butterovich has been around the program for multiple years. So if you give a scholarship to someone that's been there for two years. That's right. So it's not an initial counter. It's not an initial counter. So that's why I wanted to explain this this 13 number here. So normally you can sign, these are the commits, you can sign 25 players. Why can I, am I saying 13? Well, 10 of them are already signed. So those are gone. Um, Jalen McKenzie uh, on the offensive line. Where do we have him here? Do I have him already? 
right there. Oh, right here. Okay, Dylan McKenzie. Um, he was a blue shirt candidate, so he counted towards the class of 2018, even though he came in in 2017. That knocks one off. And then Clay Hilton gave Chase McGrath a scholarship, who had only been in the program for a year. He's an initial counter, meaning he has to count as part of that initial 25. So he also will will come off of this total. So Chase already counts. Um, Jalen McKenzie already counts, who you know redshirted last year, the blue shirt redshirted. I know it's confusing. And so you can only sign up to 13 players, but obviously that number is not even going to come into play because USC has already got 82 scholarships. So, um, you know, a guy like Ruben Peters or Grant Moore may graduate and, and no longer have a scholarship and not want to be on the team, maybe take a grad course or something like that. There's options there. I mean, I know you talked to Elijah Juan Tucker, um, you know, potential that he redshirted last year. He could transfer out as a grad transfer. So there's options. And then guys just might, you know, with no playing time, transfer out. Um, you know, JT Daniels could get the start and Matt Faker, Jack Sears could sit out. I mean, there's a lot of different kind of options there. But as of right now, USC technically only has three spots left to give, but that's going to change. We both, what do you expect, like a, a class of 18-ish or so? That seems to be, you know, 18, 19. And like, like I said, it just depends on the attrition. And obviously the coaches are, you know, aware of how many people need to go, how many people need to stay, blah, 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 you know, to figure out how the numbers fit. And you know, sometimes that becomes the ugly part of college athletics where someone gets pushed out of the door because, hey, we're going to sign three cornerbacks this period. And, you know, all three guys that we're going after end up wanting to come here. Yeah. And if that happens, maybe USC says, you know what, maybe it's best if you go somewhere else because we, you know, we've got extra guys here. You're just not going to get as much playing time. And the player says, no, I want to stay. No, I think you really need to go. Then that happens. <laughs> that happens a lot. That's that was one of the biggest issues in the SEC with oversigning, which was a you know an issue where SEC teams was would sign 27 guys when they only had space for 21. So then six people would get pushed out in some form or fashion, and so you see that. And, and the SEC actually recently went and uh, you know made rules on trying to limit that. You know other conferences have already said no, you cannot sign players over that. Actually, just to, to reference to baseball, I actually had a, a conversation with a Big Ten coach. Baseball? Yes, and, and baseball is much more strict as far as uh, scholarships because you only have 13.1, uh, I believe it is. Um, so it, it's much more difficult to divvy out those scholarships amongst a, a roster of 30 players. In the Big Ten, until a player had signed a pro contract, even if he was in the number four overall pick, until he signed that contract, you could not use his scholarship money. So if that guy was on scholarship for – uh, you know, a full ride scholarship because he's that good, then you had a full ride scholarship. You were waiting until late in the summer to be able to use. And Jeez. and late in the summer, there's not a lot of guys that are available to be, you know, trying to go after and get. So, you know, different conferences do it different ways. And conferences such as the Big Ten have, you know, been strict on oversigning. Like, no, you're not going to oversign anybody like that and force people out. Whereas the SEC was kind of more lenient on it. They've kind of toughened up on it. But it's something that still happens. You know, teams – are, go, are going to go above that 85 and they have to push somebody out to, to open it up. It's kind of an unfortunate side effect of, you know, the competitiveness that is college athletics. All right. Uh, we want to jump into the questions here in a minute, but uh, there was a tweet earlier that a couple people shared with me, Aaron and, and Berto uh, from Matt uh, Mayoko. I, he's, I, he covers the 49ers, I believe, but he said the 49ers are looking to add assistant defensive line coach uh, and they're hearing about USC defensive line coach Kenichi Udeze. Uh, is it was in the building today. So, um, yeah, the, their previous guy was Vince. Uh, I don't know what his name is, but he what joined. Yeah, he joined uh, Chip Kelly at UCLA. So um, that's one of the things where we don't know if the coaching attrition is is done. Uh, Dylan McCullough left on his own volition. I, I mean, Tyson Helton did too. Uh, Ku, uh, there's you know been talk of that potentially he could leave uh, as well. So. There's stuff kind of going on. Um, we'll see. But it's, I don't know if much is going to happen until – usually the stuff at this late stage kind of happens after signing day. But if he's interviewing with the 49ers now, that's something that could, uh, you know, that could take place. So, Yeah, and that's – you know, there's, there's become two different cycles. There's a cycle of the coaching carousel at the end of the college season when coaches get, you know, fired in December or January. And then there's a second run um, in mid – January or later when uh, when all the NFL coaches, when it's Black Monday, a lot of those coaches get fired and then staffs. 
as those are compiled together, you see movement, you know, in the college and the pro ranks. So it's become a, a little bit of a, a of a a beast at two different times in the in the year. And I don't think we're really done with that uh, NFL portion of it yet because a lot of these new coaches. I mean, there was just two new coaches hired earlier this week in the NFL, so they're still going to be putting their staffs together and stuff. So still some some movement to go potentially with the USC staff. All right, I'm going to try to do some of these questions for the first time. Let's do see. it. Okay, the first one out of the gate. This was like literally at 12. Right John did we this started. last week too. And, it, like, and we tried to work? read it and it took up the whole screen. It does take up the whole screen. You can't see me. Can you see me over here? Uh, agree or disagree? The coach Elton doesn't really do a good job of getting his team ready to play, especially against top five teams. I mean, they look like a bunch of soft babies out there. No physicality at all. Also, why isn't Coach Helton putting in the effort to hire top-of-the-line position coaches? It's not like SC doesn't have the resources and influence. I mean, how long is Lynn Swan going to tolerate USC getting humiliated humiliated by top five teams due to weak-slash-soft coaching by Clay Helton? USC is a talent. Coaching is the problem. Um, I mean, this is like the constant debate, right, that's going on in the peristyle because you can look at, well, he won the Rose Bowl, like, you know, when's the last time you saw won a Rose Bowl? Like, you know, it's been a long time. It's been 30-something years. They won the Pac-12 for the first time. Sark couldn't do that. Lane couldn't do that. He won 11 games, but people are still kind of unhappy. So I, I think there's somewhere in the middle. I get that, you know, but to, to dispel him like he's a, a 500 coach just seems like crazy to me. Yeah, I mean, the teams they're playing are very good. And when you hire a new coach, it's not often that you immediately go to the top of the echelon. Usually there's a period where you're working towards that. I mean, even look at Alabama and Nick Saban. They were great. I mean, Nick Saban lost to, what, UL uh, Monroe, I think, Louisiana Monroe, or one of the UL directionals or something like that his first year at Alabama. It took a little bit of time for him to build the program up. Now, granted, USC maybe was in a better position as far as talent at, at you know when when Clay Helton take, took over, and he hasn't done what Kirby Smart did at, at Georgia going to the national championship game in his second year. But you, you can see some progress there, so it's not like everything is whoa. Is US, USC is not five and seven? No. You know who was five and seven? What was what was what was uh, Notre Dame last year? Four and eight. Four and eight. Yeah. What was uh, USC, UCLA last year? Four and eight. It's not like they're UCLA or Notre Dame right here, but. Obviously, you want them to play better. You want them to play to their ability, and that's been an issue in some of the bigger, more physical games. Uh, so looking at what USC you know, has done in some of those bigger games, they, they've showed up against Penn State. They've showed up uh, against Washington last year. That was Washington was a physical test for them. Yeah. That defensive line was really, really good. Their cornerbacks were really good against USC's receivers, but USC found a way to win that game. They beat them in the trenches. Now, have they done that consistently? No. Have they shown flashes of it? Sure. And, you know, that's what USC, you know, they want to do. So that's what you have to see progress towards. Now, that's the, the big question is the offensive line going into the next season. You know, this is the third season under Neil Callaway. This is the longest tenure any offensive line coach has had in long time. since middle of Pete Carroll's tenure, Probably. I believe. Yeah. So you hope to see that there's some prog progress there because you had some new guys get thrown in last year. You're going to have some new guys. You're going to have to step up this year. But you have some talent. You definitely have talent there, and you have some veteran guys, especially now. You are potentially move to a Lobanon inside. You have him, Chris Brown, and Chuma Adoga are three guys that have been there multiple years. So uh, you have to see progress on the offensive line. That's the biggest question mark going into next season for me. Hey, you know what? I just realized something, and uh, those are all good points. So this is a new setup, and I have a mixing board, and that's where we have our microphones and everything kind of set up in. I don't know if this is picking up these microphones if it's using the webcam mic. So here in the comments, oh crap, I don't know if I'll be able to see it. Are you looking at the comments? Sure. I'm, I'm kind of scroll backwards. If this sounds loud to you, let us know. If not, this should sound loud. Sorry, sorry that, thank you uh, for the, the help there. But we'll move on, so let us know uh, what's going on in the comments. Um, it's either the webcam that we're using or our, uh, is anyone saying anything? All right, let's pull up. We got Tarek. Uh, is it unreasonable to expect USC to get uh, the to the college football playoff in 2018? It's always difficult when you have a new quarterback, but Georgia yeah. just did it. So, I mean, Georgia is kind of an outlier in the way that they were yeah. able to to get there with a second year coach and a freshman quarterback taking over for a, I think a, a, a sophomore quarterback. So 
But if you have a really good run game, you can change a lot of things. You play defense and you run the ball, you can go a long way. Can USC do those two things? Yeah. That's the question. The running game has not been consistent. You know, they've had really big games at times, and they've had really bad games at times. Uh, and that's all starts with the offense line. That's why it's the biggest question mark, in my opinion. And defensively, I think USC will be fine. I think the the question, you know, we've heard rumors about Clancy Pendergast. Clancy Pendergast going to stay next year. I mean, if you change defense coordinator, then things could change a lot because yeah. you might have a different look of a defense. I think USC's played really well under Clancy Pendergast as far as, you know, being an aggressive team and going out and, you know, creating turnovers, creating, you know, negative plays against offense. Sometimes they give up the big plays. But I think overall the defense has been pretty good the last two years, especially, you know, with a new system, uh, you know, starting last year. Yeah. I think if you're a USC fan, you have the right to expect that. If everyone's going to tout like, hey, won the Rose Bowl, hey, won the Pac-12, you want progress and you want to get to that next level. I think that I wouldn't be betting on that happening next year. I think it's going to be a huge loss uh, with Sam Darnold, but we'll see. Thanks, Tarek, for that one. Uh, Robert says, Coach T is a great offensive coordinator. Don't know how, why uh, people are, are hating on him. It's kind of a mixed bag with T. Martin. And and I, I think I'd certainly give him a pass more. I, I feel like the offense gets muddled with the, the number of people that were kind of involved. Plus, it's like you have a staff that basically half the people don't really go out and recruit, and he does like three people's jobs there. So he's got a lot on his plate, so I kind of give him the benefit of the doubt. But there there are definitely – I'd see on Twitter and stuff, USC Twitter, like a lot of people hating on him. Yeah, you, you see kind of both sides of the coin. Uh, you really don't know what exactly is Clay – I mean, what exactly is T's calls and what input Clay is giving. And if they're a third person, how much that person's inputting. That would be really interesting to see. I'd like to sit in the booth one game. Yeah, uh, yeah. just let me I'll, – I'll be the third person. If you want me to throw some calls in there, I got you, T. Uh, just let me know. I'm available. Nice. Did anyone comment on the uh... – Yeah, they just said no. The, the sound was not exactly working for either one of them. Really? Okay. Out, so. uh, interesting. Okay, I'll figure this out. So I think when you guys do it, you're just using the the uh, webcam mic or whatever, the, the computer mic. We try to go fancy here with, like, special mics, but I don't know if this software – it's like a web-based program, so I don't know – uh, if, uh, if it's actually working. So let's see. Uh, Dominic, why doesn't the coaching staff do a better job recruiting offensive and defensive lines? They actually do. If you look at the guys they brought in, I mean, it's Clay Elton focuses way more on the, the offense, especially the offensive line than the other coaches have who are like low skill dudes. So. I think that's one of the weakest arm arguments we've seen on our message boards is that the offensive line has no talent and they're not recruiting the offensive yeah. line. Well, they went out and got five guys last year. They found a kind of a, they unearthed a guy in Jalen McKenzie, brought him in in this class. I mean, Austin Jackson's a five-star guy. Andrew Voorhees is a three-star guy that could step in. You know, that's going out and finding some talent that's not rated as highly. Um, and then I think, you know, the other guys, I think Elijah Vera Tucker, if he wasn't hurt, would have had a chance to, you know, compete for that spot with Andrew Voorhees. Uh, so I think that offensive line group is pretty good. You're bringing in the best center that I think Greg Biggins and Brendan Hoffman have said that they've seen in probably the last 10 years. And Justin Dietrich, um, you know, I think uh, Liam Douglas is a big project, but he is super athletic, a guy that they played at running back at times at, at Harvard Westlake. So I, I think they've done a good job of mixing, you know, those high-end five-star talent with guys that you can, you know, work with and in two or three years become guys, you know, your Chad Wheeler types, then rather than your Zach Benner. Kind of the, kind of the uh, dichotomy there between those two guys who both became really good tackles for US, USC you know, a five-star guy and Zach Benner, I think it was five-star, four or five-star guy. Yeah, and him, service, Chad yeah. Wheeler being a three-star guy that, you know, was kind of, that had to grow into his body more. Yeah. So I think they've done a good job of, of kind of mixing that. I think that's what you have to do. So people that, that are upset at the O-line recruiting is kind of, kind of uh, baffles me. Um, and then they were in the running for Jackson Carmen, who was another five-star guy that could potentially step in and play right away. They probably finished second or third in that battle, but that was, you know, a guy that went across the country in a year when the West is not very good on the offensive line. Next year, the defensive line will be really good in the West. There's some really good defensive line that USC is in a pretty good position for. And, the, you know, there's some some uh, four and five star, or four, three and four star right now with a chance to move up offensive linemen locally next year that USC is already talking to, you know, and already in a good position for as well. So I, I think that, that the the trenches is where USC has really pushed its uh, – you know, put its resources the last couple of years because you look at the defense line they pulled in last year as well. And, you know, you bring in Marlon Tupelo, Jake Tavella, and Brandon Peely, 
three guys at the defense tackle position. Jacob Lichtenstein on the outside, another guy that can grow into his body and, you know, maybe somebody that can contribute this year. Yeah. And then also Hunter Eccles at the outside linebacker position. So, you know, you had five guys that they brought in there on the defensive line, outside linebacker spot. So, you know, I, I think that the USC has done a, has really attacked those two positions in particular, offensive line, defensive line. So anybody that's kind of complaining about that, it's kind of a little confusing to me. Yeah, look at there's 17 dudes, you know, and it's not like there's a bunch of three-star guys in there. Like there's a lot of guys on the offensive line if you're looking at the scholarship chart. So, yeah, USC and, and Clay Elton has recruited that position uh, much heavier uh, than most, I would say. Let's go to Romero. Uh, he says, do you think Matt – uh, do you think Matt Fink can lead USC, and why couldn't he, if not? I, mean, I think he can. Like he improved, which is good. You know, he's been around a couple of years. Um, we got to see him in some live action. I'll always say USC does the worst job of getting in backup quarterbacks into the game. They just, you know, and, and all the people complaining that USC didn't blow these teams out. Like, why are we? You know, if you're going to double overtime against Texas or you know, you're tied in the fourth quarter against uh, Western Michigan. It's hard to get Matt Fink into the game, you know. So it's a lot of self-inflicted wounds. And even when they get opportunities, for some reason, they don't seem to do it well. But he got some, and I think he's looked better than, than I saw him when he came in. Oh, definitely. He, yeah. He's taken a big step since his high school. I mean, I saw him a couple times at Glendora. Uh, just, you know, adding the physical, you know, adding some muscle to his body. His, his throws have a little bit more zip on them. You know, he's do, he did a lot better this season than he did his freshman year, his true freshman year, uh, as far as reading coverages and, you know, not throwing the ball to the other team. And I think Jack Sears will take, you know, there's always a, a lot of times a big jump from that first year to the second year. And I think Jack Sears has an opportunity to, to battle in this uh, competition because I think he'll take a similar jump. And, you know, once you can read defense a little bit better and that, that second year, then I think you can compete. And I think both of them are athletic enough that you can run some read option stuff with them. I think you can do a little bit more stuff than you wanted to do with Sam Darnold in that regard. Uh, so neither one of them is going to be as creative as Sam Darnold because no one is as creative as Sam right. Darnold. But, his thing. but both are really athletic guys that can get out of the pocket and run if you need them to. Uh, Daryl wants to know who has the fastest 40 time. I think we would both argue the other does. Like, I think I'm slower. Like I actually, my, my <laughs> baseball teammates in college told me I ran in slow motion. So <laughs> We both are not very fast. And we're both pretty good at baseball. Uh, he Chuck and certainly played a lot longer than me, but, you know, I was – I was a good player, like stuff, and uh, I'm good at catch. Like I can, I can, I have a good radius. I would play infield, but I'm not going to be running balls down in the outfield or things like that. I had that. a five two forty in high school. Nice. As a wide receiver, that's not a really good. Yeah, thing. and I didn't, you know, I didn't play those things. You were doing pads. Uh, let's see. That was improvement from a five six when I went into football. So we we tested like the first day. Like oh five six, that's awful. Yeah. So we're both pretty athletic guys, but neither of us are speedsters. We'll say. Uh, Enrique, can they bring in an NFL corner to work with? Uh, well, that's illegal because they, you know, once they're in the NFL, they're not allowed to play. So I don't think you can do that. Uh, I, maybe we were talking about <laughs> quarterbacks coach to bring someone in. Uh, I'm not exactly certain. Yeah. Question is here. Uh, Gary, what kind of confidence does Swan have in Helton? I uh, got to hear him speak after the Pac-12 championship game. Seems like he had a lot of confidence. You know, obviously we're hearing there's some different rumblings from behind the scenes, but. Uh, it's always hard when it's not his guy, you know. But if Clay keeps delivering wins, like, he's not going to fire him with an 11-win season. You know, a lot of fans, not a lot, but a bunch of fans want to see, to see that, which seems a little crazy. Yeah, you're not going to fire him when, when you win a Pac-12 championship and you you go to a major bowl. However, how much are you going to support him? That's going to be the question as we go yeah. into this next season. Uh, Reba loves your hat. Thanks. Let's throw it out there. Um, here's Robert. Uh, coach Elton is not the right coach for USC, so he's not a fan. Uh, certainly better than Sark, and he has more success than when Kiffin was there. However, we need a coach that delivers the goods when playing top five teams. So that's kind of like that common. Uh, so they what, beat about, top five what teams. about when they beat Washington and beat Penn State? Everybody just keeps forgetting about those games. Yeah, uh, there were some. Yeah, there are definitely some good ones. We get what you're saying, that We understand that people didn't like the hire. Um, you know, he didn't have the resume to be the, hot, the, the, the head coach at USC. He's now delivered though. Some pretty special moments. Um, is he going to be able to take that next step and, and compete for national championships? You know, and can he do it without a pretty special quarterback? Yeah, so that's that's what a lot of people are. Uh, uh, Garen defense wins championships. Something SC needs in 2018. Yeah, they they need a defense. Like 
I think legally you have to have a defense out there. It's not a question. Um, we got to keep it to the questions. We're, yeah. never, we're only six minutes in on the questions. So. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I don't know if there's some. Smoke. Okay, so this is Jamie. Scale of one to 10, what are the chances Etsy pulls in OG and ITS? That's not, like, these aren't diseases, these are recruiting questions. <laughs> So, yeah. One of my favorite things, I, I want to know, eventually, I'll talk to Elijah Griffin wherever he goes. Eventually, Elijah Griffin is OG. And ITS is Isaac Taylor Stewart, uh, two of the top cornerbacks in the in the West for sure and also in the country. Elijah Griffin, the son of Warren G. I kind of wonder if he purposely made his initials OG. <laughs> I got I to find out that from Warren Do G that. at some point. Warren, if you're watching, let us know. Um, <laughs> you know, they have a great chance with with Elijah Griffin. I think USC kind of leads there right now is, is what the latest we're hearing. ITS is kind of the the question mark. No one really knows exactly what he's doing. And I've heard some people say USC shouldn't even be going after ITS because they don't think that he's a player that's going to work. But he has all the measurables. He has it's everything you can corner. want. Yeah. He is super fast. He's super tall as a cornerback. You know, you, you can put him out there right now and he could physically match up with anybody. Um, that's the type of guy that sometimes you take and say, I can make him good. I can make him work. So we'll see what the USC does there. He's kind of a, a wild card just because he's a guy that, that really likes the SEC. He's talked a lot about Texas A&M, his business there. Talked a lot about Alabama, having an opportunity to go there. We'll see if he decides to stay close to home. If he does, it'll be USC. If he doesn't, it will get probably in the, in the SEC. This is an argument that I hate all the time. Uh, Pete wasn't a home run hire at first. LOL. And the dude before him was supposedly a hot – a hot run hire, I think he means home run hire. Uh, but all he did was bring Carson Palmer. So you're talking about um, Mr. Hackett. Uh, so here's the here's the thing. Yes, USC hired Pete Carroll and ended up being a home run hire. That doesn't mean every note, like every guy that wasn't on the top of all the recruiting boards is going to turn out to be a home run hire. That's an exception. It's not the rule. And Pete Carroll was an NFL head coach and had way more experience than Clay Helton. You know, he he made the playoff like three years or while he was an NFL head coach or something like that. So that's a very different thing. So I hate when people are like, well, Pete Carroll, nobody wanted and look, he was great. So, okay, so that means any coach you want, like you hire shotgun, that means well, Pete Carroll. Oh yeah, well shotgun, that means shotgun's gonna be successful too. Just, just right. pay, me. pay him. Uh I hate that argument. One of the things right. also is the game's different. Yeah, I think comparing coaches. I don't know if you guys remember, but Pete Carroll, that's almost twenty years ago now when he was hired. Like, that's a long time ago now as far as the game has changed. The spread offenses, much different things are going on now. So I, I think once you start comparing, like, oh, well, Howard Jones wasn't somebody that everybody knows. Well, Howard Jones was 100 years ago. So this probably going to be a little bit different. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how to say this name. Elahu or I don't know. what uh, it's, He says, who's going to be the next USC running back coach? We talked about that a bit, right? We don't really know at this point. We've heard – Reggie Bush, we've heard we've Marcus Allen. No. Well, people have said that, like USC Twitter have said that. Oh, yeah. My rule, uh, and it was, I had a rule, and then I, I think Michael Castillo from Random Troy kind of changed it a little bit to make it a Rooney rule, which I kind of like too. USC can no longer, I, my rule is that you can't hire anyone that has any ties to USC. So what does that do? That means you can only look at their resume. Like, yes, uh, we know this guy. He knows the fight song. Let's bring him in. Like, if my rule would be you can't do that. Like, so you have to go get, like, Dylan McCullough's all the time. I would say it's a rule. I would just say that you need to actually interview people. So the Rooney rule, what his thing is, like, you can't just go hire, like, guys internally unless you've interviewed, like, a couple of people. So I kind of like that, too. But I think at this point there's been too many internal hires, too many people that have ties to USC. Just go hire someone that you don't know. And you're, you're not going to hire someone you don't know who doesn't have a good resume, right? Like, yeah. the, you can – because you know them, it seems to take away resume, and I don't like that. That's so. why you go to the coaches' conferences and conventions and stuff, because you meet different people. They're here, oh, you guys are in the, oh, you guys are looking for a running back. Oh, I, I got a guy. I got a guy for you. And then you start going through the resume. You start looking at it. You start vetting everybody, and you find out that you find a guy like uh, Dylan McCullough, who's produced a couple of NFL backs in Indiana. Uh, and you're like, well, if you can do that there, what can you do here? help produce another NFL guy. And he's going to have another one, Stephen Carr, eventually. Yeah. Uh, Daryl, chances of Bush coming back to USC. Doesn't seem super likely. It, but it that, seems more likely, though. It seems yeah. like things are getting a little bit more lenient. And I think, uh, you know, eventually it will happen. It should happen sooner than later, but eventually it will happen. Um, 
Will USC sue the NCAA after the Todd McNair case is over? So Reggie Bush can come back. Uh, no, USC, that's not really in That's in not there. there. I think USC would rather have this go away because the more success Todd McNair has, the worse it looks for USC because they're like, well, why didn't you guys fight? Like Todd McNair fought and he won. And uh, yeah, we had a bunch of questions about uh, the quarterback. So Fink and uh, Sears, here's a Roberts, a Sears fan. Sears is the best athlete, I would say, of all those guys. And then Fink is maybe the fastest guy of those guys or... But Sears is a really good athlete. Yeah, it's not like Fink is in the Fink's back. a good athlete, too. He is, yeah. Um, and JT's an underrated. JT Daniels an underrated uh, athlete. So um, here's another recruiting question. Eric, do you think we have a chance at Penny Sewell? Yes. I mean, there is a reason why he did not sign the nearly signed period. Still a chance. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I have to. If I like, I'm going to try this. Uh, Tester Troy. Hey, Ryan, good to see you back. How was Hawaii? Hawaii was great. Uh, I was only there for four days. It was uh, it was definitely some a lot of work, uh, but I had some good time. We, there was a, a udon noodle place that was pretty freaking awesome that we waited like 25 minutes to get. So it's all Ryan talked about. Yeah, in his social media posts. Um, Andrew, well, we got a lot of recruiting stuff. USC is out of the running for four-star defensive tackle Michael Thompson Jr. with a little um, frowny face. You know, Gerard wasn't super high on him. Anyway, he didn't like have the best at the Iron Bowl. He did not no appreciate the way uh, he participated. Yeah. Um, let's see, Testa Troy, Sewell's rocking the Bama jacket. Uh, all of the, the Polynesian Bowl. Yeah, I was there. Um, it's funny. I had I got Talanoa Talanoa Hufunga to interview Penny Sewell because I interviewed Hufunga, and I was like, dude, this guy's gonna be president of the United States. This guy's super smart. I was like. This is great. And he was like, hey, I'm a communication major and wanted some advice on. And I was like, yeah, dude, what get you to interview somebody? And he's like, Penny. I'm like, okay. So we had him interview. And Penny had his Alabama shirt on, but he like tucked it up so you couldn't see it. But And I, I didn't coach him on any kind of questions. Like, And he asked like a, a veteran recruiting reporter a question like, okay, if you were going to commit to USC, what would the reason be? Like something like that. I was like, I didn't. I mean, that's something we ask, like when you're trying to like set up. You know, you know the guy's going to commit, but you have to talk to him before he announces, and you try to get him to talk about that, and that's a way to you know get some quotes. He pulled that one out of his butt. I mean, it was pretty impressive. So, hey, you know, they've gone through. I'm sure he's gone through the gauntlet of questions himself. So you yeah. get used to you know which questions you need to hear, which ones you know are are valid. So they they hear all these things. They know. Yeah, uh, Gerald. How many recruits can actually sign? So. We, we talked about this a little bit, but we both think probably 18 will be total, so eight more than the 10 that have already They can invited. sign 13 up to the 25, but that would require pushing out 10 people. Yeah, yeah. So that's probably not going to happen. Right. Um, Unless you see a mass exodus for some reason, which, hey, who knows? Yeah. There's been crazier things at USC. Here's a long one. Uh, Larry, stop promoting coaches within the ranks. I'm this is to not a question. Oh, <laughs> USC has the capability to bring in top-rated coaches to bring USC football back to the forefront. Do what? Uh, do you want to be nice and promote student coaches, or do you want to win a national championship with top-rated coaches? If you're not going to go, th if you're going to go through the motions, might as well be champs doing it. So he wants. Um, See, so we got We got You have to scan through. This is where Keeley is very good. You got to uh, get through. This is my the first comments. time. You know. You know. <laughs> uh, we're kind of you know doing this stuff here. Uh, so, letter we talked, we kind of talked about this already. Like we don't really know some of the names outside of Reggie Bush, who Shotgun thinks would be a great uh, coach. Uh, Mark, <laughs> uh, this, Mike is this is good too. Uh, is there a money issue paying for better coaches? And our thought has been, and, and you know, if Shotgun disagrees, he can. Um, with the the two hires that were internal. Well, first of all, Dylan McCullough leaving. I talked to him as he left. Uh, Gerard talked to him. Both he told both of us that USC fought hard. So in in my mind, that means they were willing to pay him more money. It's just he gets to go back with Eric Bieniemy, who he ran with at the Cincinnati Bengals, who became the offensive coordinator to Chiefs. It's just like a perfect situation. He might be an NFL coach for the rest of his life. We don't know. So USC was willing to pay there, uh, from what we were told. We haven't heard anything about them going out looking for a quarterback coach or a tenth assistant. You know, we did like I haven't heard you, you hear from agents, you hear all kinds of stuff. There wasn't any chatter about USC trying to get anyone like that. So 
I don't think that those two hires were about money because I don't think they went out and tried to get anyone else. They just, he kind of kept it comfortable and kept the guys that he's close to already. And it's possible that they're saying, hey, we're not giving you any money, so you better find a thrifty hire. That's possible. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, but if they were willing to spend money on Dylan McCullough, you would think, you know, I, I can't imagine Brian Ellis is going to make more money than Tyson Helton did. So he left, you free up some money. You, it doesn't seem like you're replacing with the same kind of thing, but you know, you don't know for sure, but haven't seen any indication that that was like, this is the reason, the reason they hired guys that were close and internal was because they can't spend any money. I haven't, seen any proof of that. I haven't really heard of that. It seems more likely that Clay Helton does value continuity. These guys are in the program. He's done it before. It's like a comfortable thing to do as opposed to bringing in someone, an outside voice. You know, there's chemistry issues sometimes too. And, you know, you bring in someone outside and he can upset the apple cart. So I think that's what the thinking is. There. I don't necessarily agree with that thinking. But. If there is a money issue, there shouldn't be. Yes, that's true too. We don't know if there is or not necessarily, but there shouldn't be. It's yeah. USC. You should be able to go and hire. High. You should be able to do what Alabama did. Alabama needed a special team coach. They go get one of the best in the country, stealing away from Texas a and Like That's what USC should be doing instead of being a feeder program for NFL or USC should be the destination, not the step. Yeah. Mike, is Helton going to work on the penalty issue we had last season? You know, being 127th or whatever out of 130 teams or I, something like the that. The penalty issue that USC had last season or that USC's had for the last 20 years? Because oh. Pete Carroll's teams were always one of the worst yeah. last in the country. And the Pac-12 certainly doesn't help. Um, Jesse takes a little shot at you. You're more like a BB gun. Nice. Uh, yeah, another question. <laughs> but I like that, though. I think if, they take a, if you take a shot at shotgun, I'm going to put it up there. Andrew really butchered Kenichi Daisy's name, uh, at least Koichi. Just one letter. Uh, might leave the program for the NFL. Uh, we don't know, but you know he's. It's, okay. We talked about that at the top of the show. Not Again, a question. not a question, but we want to <laughs> look at comments and stuff. Uh, no, we have thirty more minutes of comments. Oh, sorry, we got to kind of go through here. All right. Uh, Especially when we've already talked about stuff. That's true. You guys can watch the replay from stuff we've already talked about. Yeah. If you um, so we're getting a lot of stuff. Uh, here's a, I'm going to play a comment just because I need to like pause a little bit. Pendergast uh, and the defense have uh, always done their job. Do you like? Do you agree with that? Like, I feel like most of the time. Yeah. The, the thing the thing with Pendergast is because it is a you know an aggressive defense. If someone has the scheme down, say in uh, Tempe before a tarmac firing. How many points did they score in that game? That was Clancy Pendergast's defense. Yeah. I mean, that was, what, 60-something 60, 60 points? When a defense, when an offense is going well against the defense, uh, against Clancy Pendergast's defense, when they have the scheme down, then they score a lot of points. When And then it's either it's a boom or bust type of defense. Yeah, and I think, I think he always has a scheme. And I think if you look at the two sides of the ball, there's less, like, NFL talent on the defensive side of the ball than the offensive side of the ball. It was his past series. Yeah, and I think he does a little bit more uh, with less. Um, another comment. Biggie has to play safety. He doesn't have to play safety. Look no. how well he played the last couple of games after he yeah. came back from injury. Now, is that what he wants to do? And that's a possibility that USC could potentially put him there because they have an opening at safety with Chris Hawkins graduating, with Matt Lopes graduating. Maybe that's something they try. We'll see. That's something that we'll see in the spring. Uh, but that would be his decision. I don't think he should. I think he's a great college cornerback. Now, is he going to play that position at the next level? Maybe not. Maybe he senses that, and maybe he decides that, hey, coach, I would like to take a look at safety in the spring, and then we'll see that, where we go from there. Testa Troy, uh, do you guys have any insight on if Clancy will use more rotations next year? I felt like we had a lot of average players getting time, and they had some real talent behind them. Um well, if, if the average players were getting time, then the, the talented players behind them were not doing enough in practice to showcase themselves. They were not good enough. Um, Clancy Pendergast is going to play the players that he trusts. Now, as he says it, that trust can build over a season, and you see that you know his rotation goes from you know maybe 10 or 11 players at the beginning of the season to 14 or 15 at the end of the season. I mean, you saw guys like Akili Ross, Matt Lopes get in there. You know, rotating in pretty regularly during some games. 
Uh, you saw Christian Rector move up the depth chart. You saw Malik Dorton move up the depth chart and, and get more opportunities late in the season. So uh, if you earn those opportunities, he'll give them to you. However, you have to actually earn them. You're not just going to be given, oh, we need to rotate, so I'm going to throw these extra guys in. Uh, you're not going to see the, you know, the Ohio State type of line where we're just going to throw, you know, we'll keep mixing and matching guys how it goes. Or even the, the Philadelphia Eagles do the same thing. Chris Wilson, former USC defensive line coach, yeah. who's done really well there. They basically do four in, four out at times, and you know that's kept like their hockey. guys. They've <laughs> kept their guys really fresh, and they felt like some of the older guys have felt really fresh coming down the stretch and it played really well uh, in the at the end of the season and in the playoffs. And they've said that's one of the reasons. Different philosophies. Now, when you're playing 12 straight games like this year, you should have probably rotated a little bit more than they did, <laughs> uh, knowing that you're going to you know you're going to have that wear and tear. And you have so many injuries that USC had, but that's just not Clancy Pendergast style play. He plays that NFL style where it's my best 11 are going to be out there pretty much every play. Let's see. We got Anthony. How much tougher is the 2018 schedule compared to 2017? Ooh, that's a good question. I think it's, I think it's significantly tougher. Really? Because you have to also consider 12 straight weeks, no buy. I think that I, road game, Friday road game. You don't have yeah. a tra- necessarily an automatic trap game in that Washington State after playing on the road, traveling on a Friday. But I think they could but, start off terribly, and it's Texas is going to be a lot better, and could. it's on the road. I, I, yeah, the twelve straight. I think games. Was, I think USC killed themselves on that because that was like in I their think head. the teams on the schedule. It, it may be more difficult in that regard that you're playing Stanford and uh, Texas and Arizona back to back to back basically, but. 12 straight weeks is unheard of. Right. Having no bye week and then also having the the automatic loss uh, at the Washington State because it was an automatic loss for all the Pac-12 teams when you play a road game and you travel for a Friday game, I think that's much tougher. You don't have an automatic loss in that you, on the schedule this year uh, just because of the scheduling. Now, there are the teams probably are better. Stanford, probably. Their offensive line is going to be much better. I think with KJ Costello, Bryce Love comes back. They have some question on defense. Yeah, defensively. I think Texas will be better, but Texas wasn't great this year, and they lost a bunch of players that, that they were their best took players. Double overtime to beat them. True. At home. But are they going to be that much better? The, that, that's the question I want to, you know, and maybe it's just Tom Herman needs a full off season and he gets his guys. Yeah, Tom and Herman plays the big games pretty well. But how did they do this season? What did they finish six and six? Yeah. And they lost like their like seven best players off the team. Yeah. So I don't know that Texas is going to be that much better. Can USC win there? That's going to be tough, obviously. Young quarterback, especially. And I think that that early stretch is really tough with Arizona and Khalil Tate. You know, they could be really good. Um, so uh, and I think Kevin Sumlin's going to, going to fire that team up. I think they'll play really well this first year, at least. I would say the schedule in 2018 would be easier if they had Sam Darnold at quarterback. Oh, but, they do not. but that's not the schedule. That's right. the players on, on the team. Uh, good question, though. Good yeah. Daryl, have either of you seen Lin Swan coach up wide receivers at practice? I don't. He's not pulling the Pat Hayden where he's no. in on the recruiting meetings and stuff like that. He, he's hands off in that regard. Uh, Keith says Stanford followed by at Stanford at, by at Texas seems like a difficult schedule to me. Uh, are there any other tough spots on the schedule or trap games I'm overlooking? At Utah is coming up like two weeks after that too. I think that's like week five. I think uh, it, well, I think it's the play it uh, easy game those two and then Arizona right after that. I think it's uh, yeah, Arizona Ari- at home. And Arizona. That's, uh, you know, like that's real. Uh, oh, here, while you're looking that up, Sean was saying Hackett was supposedly a home run hire. No, he was not. He was like an offensive coordinator for the Chiefs at the time. Like, those are not home run hires. Like, Chip Kelly is a home run hire. Kevin Sullivan, Sullivan more like, an established college coach with a lot of success. That's a home run hire, not a, a weird, quirky offensive coordinator that has a jukebox in his basement. That's not a home run hire. Sorry. I was not around for that. Yeah, you were not around. Here, that, that was no way a home run hire. Sorry about the uh, the misinformation about the schedule. We just pulled it up. It's at Stanford, at Texas, Washington State on a Friday. But at home. At home, but still not easy. And Washington State's got a good quarterback uh, you know, that filled in this year. We'll, um, well, actually, that was Tyler Helinski, wasn't it? Sorry. Uh, Tyler Helinski passing. Uh, so they got questions at the quarterback position. True, yeah. Uh, but then you have at Stanford. So that's a kind of a, a, a four game in a row that could be really tough, especially just playing on a Friday against Washington State could be tough. Though it is at home. 
and there'll be nobody there because nobody's gonna make any traffic. Utah, traffic. okay, Utah's a little later. I thought it was at, at Arizona's the game week five. One. Yeah, so I think that's gonna be a tough one. I think as you get through that, I think you have a you know, I don't know about Colorado, Utah. I mean, uh, I, I think that's always a tough place to play. But I don't. I, Tyler Huntley was really good at times in the season during this past season. I'm curious to see how they will, you know, how they will perform early in the season. But after that, you kind of get into a clearing where there's some some easier games. Uh, and then you finish the season with at UCLA and then Notre Dame. Yeah. And, you know, by that time, Chip Kelly is going to have, you know, have made an impact on that team one way or the other. So yeah. we'll see where, where they are at the end of the season. But at that early stretch is probably the toughest part. Yeah. We both agree. Way tougher 2018. All right. Shotgun doesn't agree. But, uh, John, do you guys have any inside info on why the offensive – uh, oh, the offense in the O-line was a mess against Ohio State. I mean, I think we've talked about this at nauseum yeah. since yeah. that was a month ago pretty much. But, you know, the biggest issue, and Keely and I have talked about this a lot, so maybe missed it on that part. But the biggest issue is why are there communication issues at this point in the season? When you have four weeks to prepare for a team, why is there an issue, you know, with guys not talking with each other? And that was, you know, part of what they said after the game. It was like, oh, we, we had some communication issues, which shouldn't happen in that part of the season. Uh, well, there have been a bunch of comments about the offensive line coach. Um, so Neil Callaway, been, like, I think there's a, a balance of a lot of fans would like to see or a lot of the, I think the, the staff and everyone would like to see some continuity players would like to see that, but I think they underperformed. I mean, they have a bunch of guys that there's, there should be, you should be able to find five guys that don't get beat around like that. Um, I think it's, you know, a bit of a problem, but I, I, Neil Callaway is basically like an uncle. To Clay Helton, I do not see him making a change there. I don't think Neil Keller is a bad coach, uh, but and I also think that as much turnover has been at that one position, probably not the worst thing to keep uh, to keep a uh, coach there and have some a little bit of consistency. Not the worst thing. Now, that group has to play better. It's just plain and simple. That group has to play better. They have to play together. And that was the, the biggest issue for me is with times when they were not playing together. Now, part of that was they had some guys switch in and out this season. Uh, that's kind of always going to be an issue on the office line. You're always going to have somebody go down, basically. Like you're never going to have five guys that stay clean the entire year. They also need a leader in that room. I think that's yeah. an issue. Now, they've had, you know, Vianna Talamayo, uh, Damian Mama, Toa Lomondon. You know, those guys were a little bit quieter guys. They're not your, your, your very loud guy. And Damian Mama didn't have to do that because you had Zach Banner in there. Now, Zach Banner – for better or worse, was the the mouthpiece of that offensive line, and you know I think it was good. You need someone who's going to be vocal and you know will call people out or whatever it needs to be done in that in that uh, locker room in that meeting room, and that's Neil Callaway right now. So you need that the player uh, a player to do the same thing as well. In my opinion. Alex uh, has a question. How do you think the running back duties are split up with Rojo gone, uh, or does Stephen Carr take over as the workhorse? Interesting. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure how they're going to do. I think I think that it, it depends on the new coach. Yeah, I mean, it because if you get a coach who wants to run one guy, and then we'll sub in when he gets tired, you know, Steve Stephen Carr. If you see Neil McCullough had specific packages because he wanted to use all four of those guys, so you saw the when they went with two running backs in the shotgun, it was usually Oxidic Ware and Vi Malapais instead of you know using Stephen Carr and Ronald Jones together or something like that. So. Uh, I, I think that it, it'll depend on how the, the new running back coach wants to use his players. Anthony says, does it seem like Helton tries to be players friend first and coach second? No, I mean, I just think that he is a, you know, a father figure. So I think he does both. But yeah. He's quick to get on guys on the sideline. You see him pull over guys and, you know, get in their face and stuff. I mean, he's not going to have a, a full out tantrum, but he, he tells people when, when they uh, are messing up. Yeah, I think so. And uh, some of the players have said that, like, yeah, Coach Elton will, will, will go off on in the locker room and stuff. And people are like, and I think that surprises people because of how, you know, genuine of a guy he is outside of the locker room. But he knows when to turn it on, when to turn it off. I think. Yeah, it's not his go-to. Uh, I think he could certainly be a little bit more, but he does. it's not like he never does that. So. Yeah, and, like, when they have, like, uh, when they've had fights and stuff at practice, he's quick to, you know, get on all, all of them. We can't have that type of stuff and force him to do punishment and whatnot. So uh, I don't think he's terrible in that room. Uh, let's go test the Troy. Ryan, do you think Jalen Green is going to be a starter next year at wide receiver? Um, no. <laughs> do, you, do you think he will or no? Nope. 
Uh, Jamie, with Emma Ra possibly slated to get on the field early, uh, would starting JT Daniels make the most sense due to the chemistry? Uh, no, I mean, it's... You don't start a quarterback based on a receiver. Yeah, based on uh, one one receiver. So. And a freshman receiver. That. Yeah. This is, now it looks like there's a question, but this might be more of a comment, too. <laughs> so what's the deal with hiring new first-time coaches? Uh, I think what we're all complaining about is that the kids are not playing as they should be. Uh, they're not being coached up, i.e. offensive line, DBs. Now they're hiring first-time coaches instead of going out and getting the best coaches out there, and Western Kentucky is not USC. Why? If you're an English major, please don't read that uh, and, and mark for grammar because there's a lot of mistakes. But uh, Sorry, Greg. That's the case. Yeah. You're uh, you know, it's like um, – it's but that's – I mean, that's what a lot of the fans are kind of saying. It shouldn't be a proving ground. It shouldn't be, you know, where you're learning on the job. And I, I think if you look at someone like – Justin Wilcox, uh, I did not think that was going to be a good hire for Cal. He was not a good defensive coordinator at USC. But you know what he did really well? When he was hired as the the head coach at Cal, he took a former, you know, a former head coach to be his offensive coordinator and a former head coach to be his defensive coordinator. And there weren't – it wasn't like T. Martin being the offensive coordinator for the first time. Like I think when you have a brand-new head coach, and Clay Hilton was that, you need to bring in more established guys. And I think that was the biggest problem from the beginning is that he wasn't bringing in those kind of established names. Uh, no no comments there? No. You don't like the uh, – Casey, what's your take on Coach Callaway? Let him go if he can't make the offensive line better this season. We kind of talked about that. Yeah, I think it's a make-or-break season for him. I think it's a make-or-break season for Clay Helton. Huh. I mean, if they don't – you know, if they struggle, a lot of people are going to be calling for the hit. Patrick says, will you guys be filming PRPs like you did in the past? Uh, I kind of get the feeling that they're going to – they limited our access to those, which is a little strange because they're supposed to be player-run practices, not like – man, you know, not uh, regulated by sports information and all that kind of stuff. Last year, really, they just kind of kept – they kept the winter ones all secret. We'll see. Um, they're probably not going to throw until after signing day, and then we'll find out if we're going to be able to do that. But it could be – you know, we'll still film if we're out there. We'll still film and stuff, but it just there was only like six of them available last year or something. Like and they were really restricted as well. So for no real good reason, no. they were being restricted. The uh, players love them when we film them. You know, they love to see their highlights and stuff. They ask for pictures. They ask for, hey, did you get that catch? That type of stuff. But for some reason, the uh, school the sports information department has decided that it's not a good idea for us to be there. Yeah. Players. Tito, will it cost him? With the Coliseum being renovated, are they moving the spring game to a different location? Uh, they are. I don't know where. It looks like it. I mean, it has to be. It looks yeah. like the stadium now. I, I was kind of – I wasn't sure initially. Uh, I was like, maybe they can play on the other side, you know, just put all the fans on the other side. And then looking at it, you're like, yeah, there's no way. Yeah. Uh, there's tractors everywhere on the field. There's George. No yes, there, it's, a, it's a complete mess. And if you look where all those seats are gone, that's going to be a building, which is what we don't really like about this. Spaceship. Uh, it's a spaceship-looking thing. Uh, George, percent Jorge. chance – or Jorge. What are you Jorge? Jorge? I don't know. Uh, what is the percentage chance that Clay will be the coach in 2019? Uh, 68.9? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it, what are you going to say? That? You know, I don't know. Like, um, the question then becomes, how good do you think they'll be next year? And do you think – Nine and three is acceptable enough to keep Clay Helton around with a first-year quarterback. I think it all depends on how they do it, and it's like if I think Lin Swan doesn't like the people that are saying, "Why is USC losing the top five teams now this past year?" You know, losing to Notre Dame, losing to Ohio State. I don't think Lin Swan likes that. He doesn't like the big net. Like he liked the Rose Bowl season, you know, beating Penn State, beating Washington, and stuff. If you're losing, if you're beating like the crappy teams and losing to the good ones, I don't think Lin Swan will like that. So if you get blown out. You go nine and three, but you get blown out by the wrong teams. I think he could be in trouble. True. Uh, so okay. then your percentage might even go up or down. I mean. Yeah. Uh, Lee, I don't know. What do you say this name? Aiello or? Aiello. Aiello. Grad assistants help recruit. So you can have the same amount of people on the road recruiting. Uh, right now, like Gavin Morris is out on the road recruiting. So because they don't have a running backs coach, so yeah. he's filling in for that position, I believe, is how they're. 
Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a certain number, but it doesn't mean, like, if you're a grad assistant and, like, they're missing a coach, you could be promoted. They had uh, Pat Hayden. Yeah, I was going to say, which is how Pat Hayden was able to be a recruiter at one yeah. point. Um, Daryl, do you know if USC went after Ken Norton Jr. after he was fired? Haven't heard any of that. Um, and what would he be for? Like, they don't really have an open spot or anything. If, it, if you're going from a head coach or a coordinator position in college, you're usually not coming in. Like, people – Throwing like, oh, Jack Del Rio should be the defense coach. He's not going to go from head coach to a defense coordinator or a linebacker coach, someone even at one point uh, threw out on the board. But that's not going to happen. No. Marcus. Well, uh, so he's talking about Alan Ross St. Brown. Will, will he be returning punts? I can't imagine Harris coming back for a second act. The problem isn't necessarily the punt returner this year. The problem was more the rest of the punt return team. There were oftentimes – where there were having to be fair catches on 45-yard punts. That shouldn't happen. The gunners and stuff did not do a great job this year, I don't think. Now, Jenny Harris made some mistakes as far as calling fair catches, not letting things bounce, different things like that that Dory Jackson did not do. However, I think there were more issues than just the returner itself with that punt return unit. Giovanni. Good thing they spend an hour on it each day. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not a big fan of special teams. Giovanni, what's your guy's personal opinion on the Coliseum renovation? Uh, I hate it. I mean, the biggest issue for me is that you're taking out all those prime seats. Yes. Losing seats in the Coliseum, not a big deal. How many times has USC sold out? Yeah, I don't mind. Like, if it was 80,000, I would be fine. I don't like 70-something. I'd rather have 80. I mean, the seats way up in the corners yeah. by the peristyle, like, those are not very good seats. I've sat up there. Not very good seats. Um, when you take the prime 50-yard line seats, and you're moving season ticket holders that have been there for 30 years or something, that's a big deal. Yes. And that's the biggest issue. And if you're going to spend, you know, almost $300 million and you're going to leave the stupid, you know, sun deck in place, like that needs to be done. That side of the, there should be like a, a walking promenade or something like that. Get rid of the damn sun deck. Like that's terrible. Like where the, the Lexus suites and stuff. No, no. Like the, the, there's benches in the end zone. Like, those where like the band sits and all that kind of stuff. Oh, it, that's got to go. Like if you're you're doing that and you're not fixing, I mean you're spending all this money, you're not fixing that. Like that should be the first thing gone. And putting a, you, could, so let's look across the country and see how many people put buildings in the middle of the stands in their stadiums. Like look it up because it's zero. No one's ever done that before. And you know why? Because it's a stupid idea. And here's what they're doing. We'll see. Yeah. Well, I'm curious to see. I, I think they should have went more with like the Notre Dame idea where you build off the stadium backwards and you can build a lot of cool stuff on the outside. And you can, uh, there's this interactive museum or whatever on this side. And then you go in towards, you know, where the, the older portions of the stadium are. And things. I think they could have done a lot of different things that they did not really look at, it seemed like. Yeah. The people we talked to, to be fair to USC, like they said the Coliseum Commission doesn't allow them to touch the outside. I, I, I still think there's better solutions. Uh, than what they're doing. This one just seems like, and no one is taking responsibility. Like, hey, this was my idea, and this is why we're doing it. It's like everyone you talk to is like, yeah, that was the idea, and I, you know, I had nothing to do with it. It's like we're, that, but we're too far down the road to do anything about it. Like, if someone else did it, I'm just trying to make yeah. it as good as it can be. That's yeah. a lot of the answers we hear. Crazy. Uh, let's see, Patrick, uh, with Chen and Wusu's departure. Is Olawale Patiku's position? Is it Olawale Patiku's position to lose? Is it too soon to call him a bust? Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, that's a lot of muscle to have sitting on the sidelines. Yeah, he's like the first guy off the bus, dude. Way too soon to call him a bust. I mean, he's a very he was coming in. You knew he was a raw player. You know, he has you know athleticism. The thing he's got to work on a lot of things as far as football because that's something he had done. And he's he took a huge jump from the first year when he first got on campus to this past year. I think he can do that again. I think he can take another jump. I think he can be a viable player for USC, either in a rotation or even starting. Is it his position to lose? I think he gets the first shot at it, right? I mean, he's the one with backing so. up uh, Uchenna, so I think it's his to start with, at least at the beginning of the spring. You know, there's some other guys that maybe you could shift over there. You could probably do the same. You could put Connor Murphy maybe over there. You know, he's a big body long. You, you want that Sam position to control the edge as well as get to the passer. Eugene Nwosu, his uh, junior year, even though he didn't have a bunch of sacks or anything, he was great at controlling the edge, not letting people get around the outside. You, know, you need containment on the edges as well as a pass rusher. So 
uh, I think that if you can do the first of those, and that's been one of the issues for uh, Wale is you know containment uh, on that edge. You know he gets you know he gets excited, goes after the quarterback, goes around the quarterback, whatever. You know a guy leaks out and is able to have a, a free run out there. Those are some of the things that he's been working on, and I think that that uh, Kenny Judy Daisy and Giant Anson have done a really good job just as a development from year one to year two. And now I think in year three, you'll see another uh, big jump as well, potentially. Uh, let's try to knock some of these out. Uh, Anthony, talk about C.J. Pollard. He was a top safety on the West Coast. What are the plans for him? Could it be a possible transfer? I don't think he's going to transfer. His, he's a legacy guy. He seems – I talked to him over the offices. He's like – and he expected to be in the mix when I talked to him. He's a great kid, and, you know, he's a guy that studies real hard. I think you could see a similar path as Chris Hawkins maybe. You know, he's a, he's a cerebral guy that, that doesn't have the same athleticism as a couple other guys, but he can make more plays. Uh, he can be in places where he should be quicker than other guys because he, he can diagnose stuff a lot quicker. I think you, that's a, a similar comp, I would say, yeah. uh, is Chris Hawkins. You saw Chris Hawkins, even his junior year was splitting time. His senior year took over and was great. Yeah. Jesse, will Toa Lobendon play left tackle uh, and have Smith play center or Toa play center and someone else play? Left tackle. I kind of think Toa's going to move in. Toa's center. almost assuredly moving to center. He told yeah. me that that one of the things that would go in his decision would be his positioning next year as well, whether he would come back or not. So I would expect him to move center. Uh, John wants to know part of the reason Sam Darnold left is because he doesn't trust the coaching staff to make him a better player. I did. I wrote a piece on. I felt he regressed during his sophomore year. Um, and you look at the numbers and stuff. It definitely wasn't as good. Now he threw for four thousand yards. I think his numbers regressed. I don't know how much that he actually regressed. Yeah. Because I think he took a lot of chances last year that he just wasn't penalized as much for. And there was also times this year where he threw balls up and, you know, they weren't intercepted. There was one in the Oregon State game, I think, early. He threw it up. There was no one there, and basically the safety just dropped it. Those things happen. And last year he was trying to fit things into tight windows, and the ball would be tipped, and it would fall to the ground. Yeah. Whereas this year, ball hits off. Jalen Green's hands and goes right to a DB and takes back for the pick six. Or he throws a ball and hits Ronald Jones right in the face mask. That's a fumble on, on, on Sam Darnold because it was a, a lateral, technically. So, you know, some of the things were not his fault, and, and those count against his stats, whereas he was taking some of these chances last year, and, you know, he wasn't getting penalized for it. Let's go Randy. He says, do you guys see Step? He's talking about Marquis Step, who's a running back signee. Uh, from Indiana, uh, and Stephen Carr as the next Lightning and Thunder. I'm always a Thunder and Lightning guy, but you know, say Lightning. Well, yeah, Lightning comes first, but mm. usually Thunder you hear. He's a big guy. I talked to him. Now, he's got a hamstring injury. Uh, I talked to him in Hawaii, and he was very happy to come from the Midwest to Hawaii. He was pretty happy about that. And he'll be in Southern California. Uh, he's got a, you know, there's other guys. I think Vi is a guy that, that is uh, your first Thunder guy right now. Uh, I think he's the, the big back right now that USC uh, is looking for. Step would have to surpass him. I think Vi is going to be in front of him, to, at least to begin with. We'll see. I haven't seen much Marquis Step. Watch, watch the highlight tapes, but, you know, you got to see a guy in person first. Yeah, I wanted to see him in person, but he was injured, so I didn't get to do much in Hawaii. Uh, George says, what's with Tufele's regression? Uh, so you talk about Jay Tufele. Uh, I don't know that he's regressed. Yeah. It's just that I expected more out of him. I thought he was better than Marlon Tupelotu in San Antonio last year. So after Marlon Tupelotu had a really good spring, I expected Tufele to come in and compete as well. We just never saw that. So I don't, I don't know if you call that a regression. Uh, you get to the next level, there's different things. He's got to work on his body a little bit. That was one of the things. Um, so we'll see what it, that that. The first to second year, you often see a big jump in players. We'll see if we see it with him as well. Quinn, this is interesting. Who has the most talent? So Amon Ross St. Brown as five-star wide receiver from uh, modern day, or Devin Williams. What do you, you know, Devin Williams is probably more athletic, but Amon Ross is a way better player. Maybe you say Devin Williams has more potential, but talent, Amon St. Brown, St. Brown is – He's ridiculous. He's really, really good. Should be fun to watch him. Yeah. Uh, but like more of an overall around athlete, probably Williams. But I don't know. We'll see. I mean, can... Williams has more athletic upside than St. Brown. St. Brown is a pure technician. He just he just destroys defensive backs with his ability to run routes and and then his ability to talk trash after he's run around and score a touchdown and spin the ball. Uh, Rafael Jesus Martinez. I love this guy. He maybe he's like related to Gerard. That's good. Uh, Isaiah Polamalu moving closer to the line this year. 
as a linebacker, is that what you're referring to? I don't think so. And maybe it's as, not going to be like a Stuart Craven. Like, maybe it doesn't do like a Stuart Cravens kind of thing. Maybe okay. as a nickel back. Yeah. Maybe you see him closer line in that regard. Uh, but there's some, uh, as of right now, there's three great nickel back candidates with a Jenna Harris that have all started. A Jenna Harris, a Healy Ross, and Jonathan Lockett coming back from injury. All three of those guys have played the nickel back position and played pretty well. So I don't think you move Isaiah Paul Mal, especially with an opening at safety. I think it'll be him and Bubba Bolton competing for that as well as CJ Pollock. That's funny. 11 win team talking about who's going to replace the coach. Uh, <laughs> William, coach, if Coach Helton struggles this season, any chance of getting Jack Del Rio? You say no? No. You say no chance? No, I think Del Rio will have a job before them. That's interesting. I kind of think. I think that's a guy that would be on Lynn Swans. And that's the other thing. It's like uh, you can get rid of somebody, like if, if Helen struggles or something. Do you have any confidence that the administration is going to go out and hi- make a big hire? Like they don't do that. And and you you hire former players who have never been an athletic director before over and over and over again. I mean, Mike Garrett at least worked in the athletic department when he was hired. Like he was like promoted. Um, but Pat Hayden and Lynn Swan, no athletic director experience whatsoever. I really need to be a former athlete. Yeah. yeah. That is a good job to have. There's some tough things to do with being an athletic director. That's a good job to have. Jorge, who will be SC's breakout star next season? Sort of like the Tyler Vaughn's breakout this season that I predicted from the spring. Who are you predicting now? Uh, Tyler Vaughn's going to go into the next level. Oh. <laughs> That's not a correct answer. It might be. A, okay, so I I would say, like, we talk about Jay Tefeli. I loved him in high school. And I think some guys have a – it takes a little while to make that transition. Tyler Bonds was one of those dudes. Physicality is different, high school to college. It, and it just – it's a lot of adjustments. Like, you remember going to college. I think Tefeli could be, but they're not – I don't know if he can break the rotation. If Clancy Pendergast is still the defensive coordinator – I don't know if he's going to get in the rotation. Or but not, there's know? an opening there because yeah. he's he was behind Rasheem Green. You know That's he'll right. be competing with Malik Dorton. That's so, our next question. So replace the Rasheem. There you go. So he will be competing with Malik Dorton. I think Malik Dorton gets the first shot there, and then I think Jay Tefeli is a guy that can be like Malik Dorton did and work his way into the rotation more and more as the season goes along. And always this defensive lineman. There's a chance of injury as well. So I, I think you can see somebody there. My breakout star. Okay. I'm thinking either Bubba Bolden or Levi Jones. Yeah, I would go with Le- I mean, either one of those guys. I would like. Yeah, Levi. Then, Levi could really. But again, it's like. And then the the other shot is what about JT Daniels? JT Daniels could be your breakout star too. I like Gerard's uh, theory on this that um, he's not going to win the job because we're going to Sam Darnold it so that the guys can't leave and yeah. transfer. I think that's a possibility. I think it's just going to be tough to win a job when you have a month to win it versus guys that have been here for two years and also have the full spring to compete against each other. Because there's no other – they're getting almost every rep. You're going to get a couple of the walk-ons will get to throw every once in a while. But you have two scholarship quarterbacks. They're getting every rep this spring. Yeah. Uh, Randy, can you talk Clay Hill into doing a live Q&A? We, uh, Clay Hill has been super accommodating. Like he came down to our – like. Uh, party at uh, Trader Joe's, the opening we did there in August. Dan had, you know, sit down one-on-one with him. I'll probably get him on the podcast uh, this offseason. Um, yeah, we try not to ask too much of him, but, you know, we, we'll do stuff uh, with him. But I don't know if I, you guys know, it's it's a busy part of the year. Yeah, right now, no. To him to do a live one where you guys are all saying, like, he sucks and all that stuff, like, probably not. I, I wouldn't, I don't think I would ask him to do that in that situation where, if there was, like, moderator where we could, like, get rid of comments and stuff or he wasn't seeing them maybe but i don't i don't think that's the best like well i mean he'll he's definitely been accommodating he'll come on our shows and, and do stuff like that but i don't know about coming in here and doing it live you think that'd be a good idea or, i don't know it'd be fun uh justin which red shirt uh guy do you see making the most impact this coming year i mean sort of so like jay defelli has a chance yeah. right um here we can pull up the uh isaiah pull him out Isaiah pull him out. Okay. Ooh. No, no. Here we can. I was going to say Greg Johnson has a chance too, but Iman Marshall came back. So here we can look at the, uh, so some of the red shirt guys. Or your easy answer is like Reed Budrovich. He's obviously going to make it. <laughs> but he didn't red shirt like last year, right? He didn't say last year. He uh, said red shirt guys. Oh, anyone that like, you know, red shirt. Well, Taylor Katoa. 
I sh- uh, you know, I, it'll be interesting to see where he fits in. Uh, you know, you've got a couple of inside linebackers. I think John Houston really came on uh, this season, in the second half of the season. So, you know, where does Taylor Katoa fit in? How does he fit in with those new guys? You know, he was back doing a little bit at the end of the season. Uh, you know, when he comes off that injury, you got to get guys, got to get used to it. He gets a jump start on those other inside linebackers that are coming in. Uh, Pali Gaetote and uh, Raymond Scott, who we expect to be the inside guys. He'll get a jump start on them because he'll be there this spring. But he's basically competing with, with a couple of freshmen now. Uh, you'll get a, it's basically like he's an early enrollee because he'll start. <laughs> Granted, he did have a couple of practices last year before tearing his knee up. So uh, I think he has an advantage on those guys. But or is anyone going to break into that rotation in front of John Houston or Kim Smith? I don't necessarily see that happen. Maybe Mar- you'll see more guys on the outside. There'll be rotations there. Maybe Marlon Tui Like uh, that's true. He's a red. I, I, I'll I forget that he's a red shirt. Field. Yeah, he red shirted. Yeah. Um, I think uh, Alio or whatever uh, was talking about. Is there a day where, like a recruiting day, where you can bring in recruits and have them talk to legends like Reggie, Matt, Carson, stuff like that? That's I illegal. I right? think it's illegal. Like you can't really use those guys to. Um, I mean, I'd like if they happen to be on campus or something, but I don't think you could like organize some yeah. of that. Like, um, Gerald, uh, how much involvement will Clay have with the quarterbacks, even with promoting an assistant to quarterback coach? He's a quarterback coach by trade, and he's always going to have his hand in that. And he said that before. He's like, I, you know, that's the position I look at. It's one I focus on the most. So he's going to have a hand in it for sure, especially with the competition. Yeah. Kevin, how would you handicap the quarterbacks? Um, like handicap, like are we trying to handicap, or just like the, the oh, race? like are, are we talking like Tanya Harding? Yeah. <laughs> 20 That's 20. how you handicap. Just take it, you know, iron pipe to the knee. That's how you right. handicap them. Jeff Galuli and all those fun people. <laughs> I think Matt Fink is, is is the guy to beat right now. Uh, we'll yeah, see. I would think so. The, the spring will tell us a lot. Edward, well, any not su- everything because the fall will bring JT in. Edward wants to know any surprise commits. Um, if I told you, that would be a surprise. What? So you can't you can't do that. Um, Patrick, do you think Levi Jones or Palie? Not ote ote, like so he was telling. Me, ote, yeah. not, it's like a not not a g or whatever. And I I think Palie, I said that right, but I screwed that one up too. Uh, do you think he'll steal John Houston's spot? He was effective last year, but lacks a physical presence. You want a linebacker, inside linebacker? I, I mean, it's John all about Houston trust. Was really good at yeah. the end of the season. Like he was, he made a lot of plays going down the stretch that Stanford game in the, the Ohio State game, which are physical teams that they were facing. Um, so, Nagyote is one of the top-rated linebackers on the West Coast in the you know, last five years or so, but you got to see him make plays. That's one of the things yeah. I've watched Bishop Gorman and also these All-Star games, and not, not a ton of plays made. That's fair. But he's, like, he's freaky. Um, and I think the problem is Pendergast loves his dudes, like, he drew he, the veteran guys. Like he's an NFL coach, basically. And we'll see where he puts him because when Palie was making a ton of plays was his junior year and previous at Bishop Gorman when he was on the outside and rushing the passer, and he was really good at that. So he likes being an middle linebacker. Um, he, he said that, but I think on the outside edge, he, he's showed more there. Now that doesn't mean that he can't become a great middle linebacker too. Uh, so we'll see where they put him and how he develops in those uh, first. First month of all camp. Kirk, I don't want to read all this stuff because Shotgun gets mad at me when I read comments, but I put Kirk's comments. So some positive comments. Like, I don't understand all the Clay Helton bashing. Um, there's, I mean, there's a lot of it. I mean, we like most of the questions we get on the podcast, but there's a lot of fans. If you read Twitter, uh, just simply not happy. It's, it's, it's kind of weird. It's kind of baffling, but I, mean, I get where some of it's coming from, but I want to put your comment up there as well. Thanks, Kurt. Uh, Daryl, do you see Grimes having a breakout year? Randall Grimes. I don't think so, and I don't know why they burn his red shirt as bad. I don't know why either. I think I, the reason why I don't think I think he's perfectly capable of having a breakout year, but I think he's behind some really good guys and that are have you know developed really quickly in Tyler Bonds and Michael Pittman, and then also you bring in Amon Ra. Where does he fit in the mix? Do you put him inside? Do you put him outside? I think Joseph Lewis is ahead of Grimes as well. You have a couple other guys that that have an opportunity that could you know be even uh, above them on the depth chart as well, with Josh Morgan, Bebe, and some other guys like that. So uh, you know, I don't think I think he's going to be buried in the depth chart a little bit this year, similar to Josh Morgan, Bebe this past year. Uh, Bruce, will SC keep five scholarship players on special teams? 
if they're smart, they wouldn't. Yeah. That is not a smart usage, uh, not a smart allocation of, of uh, assets. No, yes. yeah, I would agree with you there. So we'll see what happens. Um, I mean, a guy like uh, Chris Tilby, he's a senior, you know, he could, you know, be an early graduate or something and, and move on. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, we haven't seen the transcript, so we don't know exactly where these guys are. I mean, USC really pushes the graduate three-year plan. That's something they want you to do. They want players to do so that they have that option the fourth year. Hey, you can leave. You already got your degree. You can leave to go to the NFL. It's fine. Or, hey, you're not getting play time here, but maybe you can somewhere else if you're a graduate transfer. So that, that's one of the things they, they really try to sell hard in recruiting uh, with Clay Helton is, hey, we want you to come in. We want you to be on a three-year plan so that you can get it out. So you hear when you hear guys say, I want to be at USC for three years like Achille Ross, then that's actually the plan for a lot of them. We're going to wrap this get up. Get all of our summer classes in. Try to wrap this up. Uh, Jorge, will Stephen Carr have a Rojo-type sophomore year? How many yards do you predict he will rush for? I don't know, but I have been on record saying that he will be in New York for the Heisman uh, oh. presentation as a junior. As a junior? As a okay. Junior. Interesting. And, I mean, I love the fact that he catches the ball out of the backfield. He did have a couple fumbles. He got banged up a little bit. Um, but I think he can have a pretty big um, year. All right. I think we'll, this is one last question I think we'll do. Why does SC show up to every big game and look vastly underprepared? Notre Dame, Bama, Ohio State thought. So what about Washington and, and Penn, State? Penn State? No one, no one just leaves them out. It just leaves them out. Now. It's part of the narrative or whatever. Man. True. I get it. I mean, I get what you're saying, but you can't. You can say there's a concern there, not like every big game. You just can't make this sweeping statement that every big game they don't show up for because that's that's not true. And it's certainly. I mean, you can say Nick Saban's terrible against his rivals because every nine win Auburn team has beat yeah. Alabama every year. Every single time. If Alabama, if Auburn wins nine games in a season, they beat Alabama. Oh, All God, right. Nick Saban. Oh, no, he doesn't win big games. <laughs> kind of won some other big games in there. It helps the SEC get some into the playoff. Yeah. It's a, a good system there. Okay, well, there's just one last one. Tester wanted us to predict every game and wanted Keeley to be a part of that. So we'll, we'll save that one for Keeley because she loves making predictions. But what guys are you guys most excited to see get a chance next year? I want to see Austin Jackson take that next step uh, up to a starter. I think that's a good one. I think seeing him, it's not always exciting to watch offensive linemen, but I think, you know, he's a five-star dude that you really want to just see be a dominant player on the line. I want to see Nancy Ote. I want to see Levi Jones. I'm interested in that linebacker core a lot. On the offensive side, I want to see what Joseph Lewis, if he gets an opportunity because, mm. you know, Joseph Lewis, my guy, He, uh, I've seen him grow so much in three years going into college, and uh, I would like to see him. He, I think he can take that same step that Michael Pittman took his freshman year to becoming a big contributor his sophomore year from special teams to catching touchdowns. I would say Tyler Vaughn's for sure. He's, you know, he's the <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you love him so awesome. much, why don't you marry him? He's, he's awesome. I just, you know, he's really, really. I remember Keyshawn Johnson. I, we were at some seven on seven thing, and Keyshawn Johnson. I think his son was being recruited at the time, so he was always like bashing. Now playing the rest of the receivers. And he was telling me like that guy's not a receiver. He's not that. And I was like, I mean, obviously Keyshawn Johnson forgot more about playing wide receiver than I'll ever know, but. I like I think that guy's good, you know. <laughs> what do you want to say? What do you think Tyler Vaughn's best asset is? Um, I think it high pointing the ball. Like I think he's he can he makes those tough catches that are like it's out of a normal like you have a, catch, a, radius, a yeah. catch radius. He can get catch them outside of that radius. So catching the ball. Yes. <laughs> so catching the ball. The the first game I saw of Tyler Vaughn's, he had four drops. Really? Um I think seven Pass a ten, or targets or eight tar targets, and I was like, this guy is a five star. Weird. Yeah. I was like, Trayvon said he's really good. He's catching everything, and I was like, Tyler Vaughn. I was like, maybe he's just stick with baseball if you can't catch the ball. And then you see him as he progresses, like, oh, okay, nasty, nasty yeah. one. And I think the surprising thing for me is his ability to run after the catch too, where I didn't yeah, think like he like breaking tackles, break tackles, stiff arms and stuff, and you know, breaking the wrist. No, oh, that's a, that's a penalty there. Oh my God! When he spun the ball, it was yeah. terrible. But that was after a nice catch and run as well. Yeah, George Lopez says uh, here. I'll, I'll put, George, since you're like, oh, oops, so that was uh, it moved. Uh, he's smooth and methodical. And uh, George says he's got the best hands on the team. I mean, it's hard to argue. Like, he well, now that Deontay's gone. 
Yeah, that's pretty damn good hands too. Um, I, had, oh, I don't know. I, I might take Trayvon Sidney, former Bishop of Montana. He, I mean, I filmed him for like three minutes, just making one-handed catches one time, and it was pretty spectacular. I mean, he was he was damn good. Uh, but I mean, and and he's done well when he's got his chances in the game. So you can't say, oh, he doesn't do it in the game because yeah. the few, the couple of plays, he would get one or two plays in some. I called him a uh, one play tray yeah. because he like four or five games this season he played one snap. Um, and Deontay Burnett would need a break and he'd go in and like two or two of those he got caught a pass and, like it was like a third or fourth option. Sam Donald said, "No, hey, I'm open. I'm always open. Just give it to." Me. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we're gonna wrap it up here. Thanks for all the comments and uh, and seeing and you know interacting with us. You know, hopefully, I'll get the hang of this new software and stuff. It's kind of cool. Though. I like that we can show people's faces and, and their questions and stuff up on the, the broadcast. And I'll, I'll get some of the technical stuff, make sure that the microphones are working great. Sounds like they're sounding fine, but I think we could probably improve it uh, a little bit on that. And Tequili, I hope you feel better. We, we're going to go to lunch now, and I'm going to take shotgun for probably like a bread bowl. We're going to eat lots of gluten because <laughs> Tequili is a gluten-free, has a gluten-free lifestyle. So we get limited sometimes with what we can eat. So we're going to go to the gluten store and just buy lots of gluten. I don't know what it is. We're just going to buy lots of gluten. And, Stephen, you're absolutely correct. There's no such thing as stock neutral. Keely, I know you're sick, but listen stock up. Stock neutral. It's funny. I was listening to the Rain of Troy podcast, and they think their stock neutral is a good no, thing. No. So, or they were on – it might have been with, uh, like, the Traveler Hates Thursday folks. Like, they're all doing it, and I think they might have all Those agreed with it. Those are stock neutral. So are you guys going to do a uh, Family Feud podcast this week? We've or? wrapped up our season. So we're waiting until after signing day. We'll have one after signing day. Okay. We might even have stock ups and stock downs on on uh, recruiting. Who knows? Tester Troy says she's always sick. She, uh, poor she, she's better this year. She's better this year. Maybe she should eat more gluten. Maybe you'd like be less sick. So uh, we love you, Keely. We hope you're feeling better. And uh, I think we're going to sign out. And uh, so thanks so much for joining. You can see all of this on uscfootball.com. We'll put up the, the replay. So thanks for tuning in, and we will talk to you next time.